Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today it's my great pleasure to welcome one of the most popular and hardest working actors in Hollywood. He's appeared in films like RoboDoc, The Wronged Man, The Breaking Point, The Last Punch, and The Front Runner. And you've seen him on TV in Homeland, Roots, Graceland, Stranger Things, and Lovecraft Country. Most recently, he can be seen in the pivotal role of Prideful on the Underground Railroad, now playing on Amazon Prime. And watch for him in season one on the brand new Marvel Studios series, Loki, now playing on Disney+. Plus. He's not only a multi-talented actor, but in the past few weeks, I've come to consider him a dear friend. I'm thrilled to welcome Lucius Baston to our show. Lucius, thank you so much for joining us. Hey man, I really appreciate you having me, Harvey, for real. <laughs> Lucius, you're one of those actors whose face is very familiar because of all the roles you've played. But now, with the prominence of the Underground Railroad, I think people are finally connecting a name to the face. That must be gratifying after all the years you've been in this industry. Yeah, you know, you, you, you work really hard and you grind really hard in this business. So that, that's the part that many people don't see. So to be a part of something like that with Barry Jenkins, yeah, it's, it's definitely gratifying for sure. You have an unusual background for an actor. You started out as a DJ from the age of 11 and music was your creative passion. Then you spent 11 years in active duty in the Air Force before finally turning to acting. I know you come from a military family. Was there some pressure on you to follow in your father's footsteps? No, you know, there wasn't any pressure. I, I, the main thing that my father wanted for us was just to get a really good education. That That's what he wanted. You know, he... Um, lived actually a pretty good life and he retired from the mass transit authority you know and he was army as well but he never had a high school diploma you know so so he he did pretty good for himself owned his own home and you know paid his house off and so there was never any pressure for that i think his only pressure was for excellence i think when you look at you he achieved that <laughs> i hope so man I, I hope i'm making him proud I know you are. If you had to summarize what you learned from being in the military all those years, what would it be? Discipline is the biggest thing, you know, because even growing up, like, you know, with an army dad, you know, I was making my bed with hospital corners, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I still do that today. Really? You know? Yeah. Making my bed is the first thing I do in the morning. I still do the hospital corners. You know, when you, just do that one thing in the morning, it kind of sets the tone for the rest of your day. So, yeah. How did you get into acting? Wow. And, you know, crazy story it really is, Ari. <laughs> you know, I, I was working at the radio station at the time, and there was a young lady who, who was also a co-worker there. And on her desk, she had some headshots that were laid out. Now, I didn't know what these pictures were. They were just eight by tens. And so I just thought she was conceited to be carrying around these pictures, you know, but when she revealed that she wanted to be an actress, I tell you, Harvey, probably in like, like a millisecond, I was just struck. Like I felt like struck by lightning. Nothing had ever pulled me in my life before, like, like with some sense of purpose, everything else I've done in my life had never excited me to, to the point that when she said that, I was like, I, I want headshots. <laughs> you know, and and I literally signed up the, uh, with a photographer to get headshots. Had no idea what I'm doing. Right. Just I just I just went and got headshots. The photographer recommended a class. So I went and checked that class out. I ended up in that class for four and a half years. And here I am today. It's really amazing that you followed a certain kind of intuition you had. Yeah. Have you always been an intuitive person? No, because I, I think for most of our lives, we're paying attention to what our parents want or to what adults want, teachers, people that, that are just, you know, ahead of us in life. And so we're following that, you know, we're not really taught to listen to what's inside you and, and to follow your dream, right? Because our parents were get a job, keep that job for 40 years, <laughs> you know, until you retire. Well, so it was I, all about security. Yeah, everything was about security. Nothing. It wasn't really about, hey, live your dream. And for many, you know, for many, you know, it wasn't about a dream at all. Coming to my age, and like I said, I got into it late. I, I got into the business what some people would consider late. But, but it was the right time for you. 
it was the right time because I figured out that I can do what I want to do. I never paid attention to that creative, you know, spirit in me that, hey, I could actually maybe do this for a living. Because even on the music side, I was doing that and I enjoyed that the most. You know, I made money doing that. I even DJed for my school's dance in, in sixth grade and got paid for that. <laughs> but, I, but I got away from my creative juices, you know, by just, hey, let me, I got to get real in life. I got to get a real job you know, and, but not paying attention to what was real inside myself. Well, given the emphasis on security that your parents had, was your family supportive of your decision to go into show business? You know, I, I, I will say my father was very supportive. Like he, he, he wasn't alive for me to, to know about the acting, but when we were young and we were, you know, doing the music part and my elder brother was buying records and got the turntables and everything. My father was very supportive of that. I think because he said, whatever is going to keep us off the streets, you know, he, <laughs> he was going to support and he did. And he, he really did. He didn't give us any problems about doing the music or anything like at all. Maybe late at night when it was like, okay, guys, okay, now it's time to turn it off. But really, really never got in the way of that. And, you know, I don't think I ever got to thank him for that, but that, that was really, really a strong thing for him to do. I think you've thanked him by being so successful. I really do. Uh, thank you. I, I hope so. I want to ask you about some of the most memorable movies and shows you were in, starting with Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, starring Nicolas Cage, Eva Mendez, and Val Kilmer. That's one of my favorite films that you've been in. Can you share any memories with us about making it? Yeah, you know, what's very interesting about the role that I played there, the role of midget, you know, which was Exhibit's right-hand man, you know. What was really cool about it was there was a day on set where we were going to shoot the scene where they kind of pulled me out the armoire. And I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to meet him, you know, so he, he came into the house and everything. So I literally left, you know, to go into the kitchen or just a different part of the house because to me, I'm somebody that does not like cops. I don't trust cops. So I didn't want to meet him and have any kind of friendly interaction, you know, so that, you know, whatever you saw on screen was just going to be genuine and, and organic, you know, so, so we didn't really talk. I didn't really talk to Nicolas Cage until after we shot that scene and maybe about, and we did about maybe five to six takes of it, you know, and, we, and then we spoke afterwards and he had asked me, he said, Hey, he said, man, you're really good. Why aren't you in Hollywood? I said, cause my most important role is dad, you know? So, <laughs> you know, and so I said, I didn't want my daughters, you know, having, having uh, daddy issues and ending up on a pole somewhere. So, <laughs> so, we, so we had a real good, but that was, that was probably maybe one of the first times in one, that, that was also kind of like really my first major role, but that was the role that let me know that I was on the right path. Yeah, I think it also let your fans know when they first really got a taste of your talent that you were on the right path. And I love the fact that you've got that priority that being a father was more important to you than your own personal self-absorbed success. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, fatherhood is is my most important role. You know, you know, my girls all grown up now, but uh, but I wouldn't change a thing. In, in any of the decisions I made about that. Well, now, like everybody else, I'm a huge fan of Homeland, which is a juggernaut of a show. And you played an African cab driver in season two, episode four, I think. Yeah. What was it like working with Damian Lewis? That was really, really cool because, you know, what, I, what I've noticed a lot with actors, especially at, at his degree, uh, very generous, very kind very down to earth. And so as we're sitting in the cab, you know, most of the time, you know, between scenes, we're just chopping it up, having fun. So, you know, it's a, uh, I, I think it, it was really, really important for me to see how to be, you know, somebody like that kind of shows you how to be and how, how you can still be gracious in this business and, and don't let any of this get to your head. So that that's the vibe I got working with him. 
I'm really impressed by that because I think there are a, a lot of people in the industry, unfortunately, who don't have it all together. They didn't have the discipline that you've talked about from your military background or even the parental stability and love and security that you had as a kid. And so they go into this business and they can't manage the success or the money. And so I'm glad that you've had some colleagues that you felt really were good influences on you. Yeah, you know, I've been very fortunate in that aspect. And I think also coming into the game a little older was a huge advantage because I now I've, I've already had some life experience. I've already, the military took me around the world. You know what I mean? Uh, like I say, coming up in a, in, a, in a military family. And then I worked another job for about a whole another 10 years after in the, in the computer chip industry, you know, but I've had this life experience. So I, I didn't have to guess at a lot of things. I kind of already knew who I was as a person and who I was becoming. So none of that got in the way. I think when you're young, that can be a challenge because you, you're, you're still really figuring it out. You know, I but, think it's more than that. I think that you developed a judgment about people that your experiences in your life dealing with so many different people in so many different fields gave you an inner sense of who to trust and good judgment. Yeah, I will, I will certainly agree with that. It, it, it helps a lot to be able to have discernment. I want to ask you about Stranger Things. You played a technician in season one, episode eight, if I did my research right. Is it true that the show is so secretive that you weren't given a proper script so you could figure out what was going on? I had no idea what was going on in that show. <laughs> when, when we shot that, man, I didn't even know what I did, what it was for, why. <laughs> None of the W's were answered. <laughs> you know, I just didn't know. I was, I was like, okay, the, that's it. I did the scene. And when I left, I just said, I don't know what, what just happened, but okay. <laughs> You know, <laughs> is that is that hard as an actor when you're really given no context? You know, uh, I say the only time where that might be a bit challenging is when you may be doing the audition for it, because if you have no context of what's really happening, you just kind of kind of make a choice of, of how you're just going to approach that scene. And you could be so far off, you know, that that you wouldn't know. But if you book it and once you're on set, the, the, the director is at least going to lead you and tell you what he needs. And then you're like, oh, OK, you know, but and it was did still. He? Yeah, I mean, it tell you exactly. I pretty much did how, exactly how I auditioned for it, you know. But like I said, I still didn't know what I had no idea what the show was about. Nothing. I would I would talk to the sound guy and be like, what is what is this even about? <laughs> and some of them would go, I don't know. <laughs> so did you watch it finally? Oh my God! Yes, it was one of my favorite series ever. Like, I mean, please, a, a mix of of the Goonies and ET and all of that brought together, and all my favorite eighties, you know, flicks all, all brought together. That that was just amazing. It really was. It was one of my favorite series that had come out for sure. Well, you were in three episodes of Bigger, and you played Terry. It's one of the most hilarious and addictively <laughs> funny shows I've ever seen, and yet it's very believable. I don't know about you. But I don't like it when people compare it to Friends because I think it's a million times better than Friends, Lucius. Yeah, yeah, and really different. They're in their 30s. They're figuring it out. You know, it's certainly they're not meeting at a restaurant all the time. But, but really, really kind of the way that when I look at how, how life really is, like today, it fits right in there with, with the problems and the issues and the challenges, you know, including social media, romance, all these things. It has a lot of great elements in it, but, but it's funny, but in a way that's still grounded. And relatable. Yeah. For everybody. There are people yeah. that you wish you knew. Yeah, I know people like that. So, so, it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's a great show and it's very well written by the creator, Felicia Mirror. She, she actually did some writing on 13 Reasons Why for Netflix. Yeah, so, so when she created this, man, she, she created something that was really a gem 
And that's just hilarious to watch, man. Really is. Would you ever be interested in taking a role on a regular series where you're like locked into a character for maybe four, five, six years? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the goal, you know? That That's pretty much the goal. And I've been fortunate enough that from the time span from my start as now to do so many different things. So uh, I think it's come that time where now it's like time to find a home, you know? I think it's going to happen. And you got to promise me you'll come back when it does. Yeah. So we can talk again about it. Absolutely. Be like, remember when? <laughs> <laughs> now, for all those millions of Marvel comic fans, we have to talk a little about your role in the brand new show on Disney Plus called Loki. Now, you grew up on Marvel Comics. How yes. much fun was it to be part of that show? Oh, my. Come on. Are you kidding me? That was like a dream come true because I read comics coming up, you know, uh, fantastic Marvel and DC, you know, so where, where I would go across the street to a friend of mine named Lance Skirvin, and he would have crates of comic books and we would spend the entire day just reading these things. And so to step into the Marvel universe, there's something that I had written down on my vision board and all of that. So for that to happen and to actually have a pretty decent role, I'm, I'm very happy about that. I was ecstatic, you know, and even when I read for that, I still, I didn't know what it was exactly. It's like we kind of knew, but it was still not really didn't know, you know, and then when I watched it back, I said, oh, that's so cool. So <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another case where you were kept in the dark about the script. Yeah. Oh God, Marvels. Yeah, yeah. Mar they're, they're not telling you anything. They're not telling. You. Even like I'm saying, even even the cast, they they don't know until they know. You know, when it's time to read, maybe do a read through or something. But they're not giving stuff away, man. Tom Hiddleston has a reputation for being a gracious, humble guy, a real team player. Did you yeah. enjoy your time with him? He was gracious enough to even say to me man he said man you're doing a great job you know oh. and he doesn't have to do that you know what i mean i understand that people get in a certain position that they don't have to go out of their way to say anything nice to or to be compassionate or to show you know any type of kindness but he was very gracious and you know there was a, i had to do a lot of takes i was falling to it to the ground a lot and he would keep checking you okay you okay so no man he's a very gracious actor which means that says a lot about him. You know, he's a gracious person, you know what I mean? That happens to be an actor. But Lucius, it also says something about you because he didn't have to say that and he wouldn't have said it if it wasn't true. Yeah, you know, like I said, I've been very fortunate, man. I've been very blessed to, to really have a lot of great experiences when it comes to set and, and the actors. And I've been very fortunate to a lot of times be involved with the, the main characters so that's that in itself is is a blessing to me and man I, I'm, I'm just having a lot of fun with it i think that your sincerity and your authenticity is very palpable and that when your co-workers see that that it resonates with them i, I don't think it's at all a surprise or an accident <laughs> or even just a random act of kindness that they're doing it. I think it's that they really do see something in you. I'm not sure that you realize yourself how really good you are. Uh, you know, they, they say that the, the person that's hardest to, to look at is yourself. <laughs> well, you may be your own worst critic. I don't know. But I'm telling you, you really jump off the screen. Uh, I couldn't believe when I saw you in Homeland playing that cab driver, that accent. You nailed it. Ah, thanks, man. That 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 was fun, and uh, I've been able to do that for a couple of roles. I did a Jamaican accent in the Inspectors, and that was interesting. <laughs> you know. Now you know again, um, yeah. Loki was directed by Kate Heron. Yeah, is Kate. There any, is there any difference in terms of the atmosphere on the set when the director is a woman compared to male directors? Yeah, I'm gonna have to say yes. There There's is. Some, yeah, for me, it's it's like this just. A little more nurturing you know that 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 goes on that that a woman brings that that vibration to that environment you know it was the same thing with mara keel when i did love is and it's just this 
it just feels good. This whole feel good vibe, you know, when, when a woman's at the helm, you know, that, that I noticed is, is slightly different. You know, you feel it, you know, the energy is there. Lucius, one of the things I admire so much about you is that you try whenever possible to work on projects that have significant relevance and importance to the black community and to our shared history. I want to talk with you about some of the most important films you've done, starting with 83 Days. If anyone out there has not seen 83 Days, it's a film that, in my opinion, should be mandatory viewing for everyone. It's the true story of George Stinney Jr., a 14-year-old African-American boy that was wrongfully accused, convicted, and executed for a crime that he did not commit. Lucius, when I saw that film, I couldn't believe that I had never heard about this before. Yeah, it's one of those little known stories in history that kind of got swept under the rug and that they wanted swept under the rug, to be honest with you, because it's such a travesty of justice. And not just for George Stinney, it's for the three kids involved. You have, you know, three dead children, and then whoever did commit those crimes were not the ones that actually were accused for it or served any time for it. So, and this was you know, in 1944 and Alkaloop, you know, South Carolina. And it's just amazing that that story is just now coming to light for, for some people, you know. And then it also applies to what's still happening today, unfortunately. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to be a part of telling that story. Because when you see, I mean, he was... 14 years old and he wasn't a 14 year old of today that you know looked like young men he, he was he was less than 100 pounds when they actually put him in the electric chair and executed him he was he was sitting on a bible they used a bible as a booster seat and back then you know those bibles had a pretty good size to them you know and and he was stripped away from his family his family was ran out of town so we never saw his family again so from, from the time he was taken into custody to the time he was executed, it was 83 days. And you played George's cellmate on death row. You were kind of yeah. like a father figure and you both get executed yeah. on the same day. Is it yeah. true that the Green Mile was loosely based on the story of George Stinney Jr.? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Yes. And they used that. And, and, but they turned it into some sort of fantasy, you know, and... We want, that's another reason we wanted to tell the truth and be like, this is not a fantasy. This is real life, <laughs> you know, and the world needed to know uh, that story. So, well, the sad reality is that there are most definitely hundreds, if not thousands of stories just like this one. And it leaves me wondering, Lucius, how we can ever heal as a society in the face of such unspeakable racism and injustice. You know, I think we have to talk about it. You know, we, we have to bring it to the forefront and we have to stop running from it. You know what I mean? And, and if you think about it in South Africa, they talk about apartheid and the government apologize about it and they bring it to the forefront. They don't run from it. And, and just from that alone brings healing. You know, if you, if you put yourselves in somebody else's shoes, you can understand a little better and then you can have that conversation and, and help people release it, you know, because that's what it is. If you really think about it, America is, is, is living a trauma that it hasn't healed from. You know, so they need, to, they need to approach it and it needs to be approached in that way. And we should be able to, you know, talk about it. And you don't have to fight about it. We just have to talk about it, be objective about it and be understanding of, of how people feel and how it affects them. I liken it to if, if a woman has been brutally raped, that's going to be with her for the rest of her life. So if you think of, of an ethnicity, a group of people that that has been done to in every aspect you can think of for over 400 years, you know, it's, it's kind of something stuck with us, you know, psychologically and subconsciously and, until we can heal from it, you know. Well, like I said, that movie is definitely part of the acknowledgement of injustice and racism that have happened. And I'm so proud of you for being in it. It's monumental. Moving on now to Lovecraft Country. 
I think you were in two episodes of that show, which is kind of a sci-fi horror fantasy with the historical context weaved into the story <laughs> of a son trying to find his father. The racism is presented as a monster in that show. Are you impressed with the imaginative ways that storytellers are urging us to confront our history of racial injustice? Yes, because that really gave an opportunity to approach it in a whole different way, you know, and to also encapsulate all those different genres you just said. So most people don't know how to, if they say, how do you, how would you describe Lovecraft Country? You just did that poignantly. Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was done very well. Um, but I, but the, I think the analogy of races as a monster versus the actual monsters, which, for, which begs the question of which one is more terrifying, is absolute genius. Absolute genius. Yeah, I agree. Okay, Lucius, I've been waiting long enough. I can't wait anymore. I want to talk now about the incredibly powerful miniseries on Amazon Prime, Underground Railroad. First of all, it's directed by the highly accomplished, mega talented director, Barry Jenkins, known for such movies as Moonlight and If Beale Street Could Talk. You must have been pinching yourself to be working with such a great filmmaker. Man, are you kidding me? Ah, <laughs> oh, man. You know, it, what's, what's really interesting about that is when I did the audition for that, for Prideful, the way I prepared for that, I, I got myself, I mean, I put on these dirty, raggedy clothes. I muddied them up and I went into this audition and people on the street, because, you know, I had to walk from my car to get to the building, thought I might have been like homeless or something. But when I walked in there, but I, I did all of that for that role and they brought me back. And then I think it was like maybe like a few months later, they were asking me, hey, are you available in September? Timber. Now, mind you, this was like May, you know, and I'm like, sure, because of course I didn't know, but it's like, yeah, sure. But I still didn't know who was going to be at the helm of this. It wasn't until I actually booked it that I that I knew it was Barry Jenkins. And then when I had to actually go down and meet him uh, and, and we did the table read and when we did the table read and he was then I was like, yeah, yeah, pinch me because. This is this is big time. This is yeah, utterly incredible. And then I got a recurring role in it. Yeah, I was just blown. Uh, I was just blown, and and I really couldn't even express it because, of course, here he is. You know, from Moonlight and off of Bill Street can talk. Sat with him. You know, when we rapped in Savannah. You know, having dinner and stuff, and having at the rap party. Man, it was just yeah. I was pinching myself several times, for sure. <laughs> now, Lucius, you play the role of Prideful, who's the right-hand man of the overseer or the head slave. He clearly loves his people, but he also wants to stay alive. You did an amazing job of portraying the moral dilemma that he was caught in. I can't even imagine how you prepared for such a role. You know, uh, unfortunately, or, or, or fortunately, it's just the experience of being black in America, to be honest, that, that, that I had to just tie into and, and, and reach in and, and express because I love people, you know, and the fact that it was what you were watching, it just wasn't ma anything made up. It wasn't anything I had to imagine. It was just really being in that setting and having to do those things physically. Oof. Man, I just, every time I talk about that role, it almost makes me tear up. Well, um, what's interesting to me is that in the book by Colson Whitehead, the character Prideful is not a major character, is he? No, he's just on one page. I think he's mentioned in one sentence. He's at the party, you know, that, that's happening on the plantation with Tuso. Yeah, that's it. And, he, and Barry expanded on that character. And I, I'm really glad he did because he wanted to touch on just those those different challenges that took place on the plantation and at that time period. Well, one thing I really liked about Underground Railroad is that it portrayed Black people from that era as more than slaves. They were family members, mothers, fathers, children who loved each other. That was so very powerful to me. Yeah, those were, those were a few of the things he certainly wanted to express. He wanted to show that 
these were human beings that were just in a situation, but they did all the things that other human beings did. <laughs> you know, they 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 were they worked the land. They were blacksmiths. They were animal trainers. They were laborers. They were family people, regardless of even if family members were taken away from them, stripped away from them, killed, so to speak. Uh, they still went on being human and had to deal with all those things as such. And I think he did an amazing job of showing all those levels of that. Oh, for sure. And this wasn't the first time you were in an important film about slavery. You were in the 2016 version of Roots where you played Reverend Garland. I think yeah. you honor your ancestors, Lucius, by taking roles like this and you keep the horrific victimization of slavery front and center in our collective consciousness. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I've been very, very fortunate to, to be a part of those kinds of things. And those are kind of the stories I, I like to tell. I like to be a part of, you know, among, yes, I like to have fun and I like to do all the dramas and all the other things. Uh, but these stories are really important. They're being brushed away in history and the books. We don't talk about the real elements of what happened, you know, during those time periods and how we got to where we are today. So when people are saying, oh, my God, I'm so tired of watching that kind of stuff. And I, I'm like, no, I, I said, you're tired. <laughs> imagine, imagine their lives. So we have to honor them. We can't forget them. We can't sit there and brush it under the rug and then act like none of that ever happened. You know, uh, once you forget the past, you know, you, you're doomed to repeat it. And so I want to be a part of recognizing who these people were and honoring them in every way that I can. Well, I think you just answered the question that I was going to ask you, which is, what do you say to people, white and black? who say there's been enough movies about slavery, it was 400 years ago, it's too hard to keep reliving this pain, can't we just move on? You just answered why, no, we can't just move on. And yes, we do have to keep this front and center. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we don't wanna risk, risk forgetting these very important people. I mean, without them, I wouldn't be where I am without the struggles of the ones before me. You know, so how dare anyone say, let's forget them. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that if we accept that movies and TV shows create emotional responses in the audience and hopefully stimulate conversation, then shows like The Underground Railroad can have a cathartic and even a healing effect. Absolutely. You know, and these are also the things you can use in, in schools and education and which can kind of enhance the learning of pretty much how we should be treating one another. You know, it's like that we don't want you. We don't want to be like that. We want to be loving. We want to be kind. We want to come together and understand how we're pretty much all the same more than we are different. Lucius, I understand your next film is about the Devil's Punch Bowl, which was a concentration camp in Natchez, Mississippi, where black people were put after the Civil War. This is an important part of history that's been pretty much erased, I would say. And it's a story that really needs to be told. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that story and I wanted to go at it from more the uh, the horror genre or or suspense thriller genre because of the fact I was coming off of 83 days producing that one. And so I didn't want to go directly into another saga, a very emotional trying saga. So I wanted to tell the story and entertain in a different way. So when, when I saw the idea or, or actually i came up with the idea for the film but when i saw this this news release you know that had come out some time ago i was like oh my god I, I have to tell that story i was like how do i not know about this but like you said earlier there's just so many that we just don't know about and it's all coming to the surface but i but i think it's going to help some of these things will help rewrite history and retell history but help us move forward in a, in a more progressive way well, tell me about the landscape for people of color in Hollywood. We see the brilliance of Barry Jenkins, Ava DuVernay, Pichanda DuBose, so many other creatives. There used to be a myth that black content just did not sell in foreign markets. Has that myth finally been disproved? Absolutely. You know, 
when when we came out with uh, straight out of Compton, kick that door open, and then Get Out came out, <laughs> you know, kick that door open again, and then Black Panther just blew up the whole building. You know what I mean? You know that 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 myth was told a lot a long time, but that myth was told by Hollywood, simply just not to push those projects in the farm markets to make the money that it could have made. Because let let's face it, the biggest some of the biggest spenders and consumers in America are African Americans, <laughs> you know, in the world. And, yeah. And in the world. And yet we weren't getting a chance to really, to really show that side or to do the things that we know we were able to do. So yeah, that door has been kicked wide open. And then with the advent of, of platforms like Netflix, what they're doing, with strong black lead, Amazon, what they're doing, they're they're doing a lot of things as well, like Underground Railroad. Everybody's kind of moving forward and understanding you're gonna lose money if you're not inclusive. You know, so it just makes sense. So I, I love where it's going. Uh, some will say it's not moving fast enough, I, but it's moving. That needle, that needle is moving for sure. I'm seeing way more stuff than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Well, when my friend Ernest Hardin Jr. was on our show, he said that American Black actors today are facing a different kind of prejudice in Hollywood now. It seems like the casting directors are favoring British actors to play American <laughs> icons like Harriet Tubman, Aretha Franklin, as if we don't have perfectly well-qualified American actors to play these roles. I think he's got a really valid point, don't you? Yeah, there's two sides to that coin because we're actors, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's almost kind of like we're importing things for the stuff that we already have, you know, but listen, man, I tell you what, if I had the opportunity to go over to England and do an accent and they loved what I was doing to be able to do that, I take that on too. So as a, as an artist, it doesn't upset me. It doesn't bother me, but I know why they do it because you got to remember the entertainment industry is about what's popular. It's about who's filling those seats and, and people love foreigners. It's, it's just the way it is, you know? And so. Are you surprised when you watch the Oscars? Almost everybody has an English accent. <laughs> it's like, is there anybody from here? <laughs> you know, but I can't be mad at that either because the fact that they grow up in the arts Unlike, you know, in America, we re we remove the arts from schools. It's one of the first things to go. And so, but not over there. That they're they're born in it, they're raised in it, and, and they push it and they promote it, you know, unlike here. So it's it's kind of <laughs> what do you do, <laughs> you know? Well, I'd like to see American black actors and actresses get to play American icons. Because yeah. if we're talking about somebody from Detroit, I think it's more authentic if the actress playing Aretha Franklin actually knows where Detroit is. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? So, so I, like I said, I get both sides of that coin. It, it, it's it's kind of like when they used to use, you know, whites to play natives <laughs> in the old movies, you know, <laughs> not as bad as that, but, but but kind of on that on that same level of things. It's like, get, get some authenticity, you know, coming into it. You know? you know, Lucius, in our conversations, I can sense your tremendous self-confidence and self-esteem. In a profession that's filled with self-doubters, you've always believed that you were going to succeed in this business. You had no doubt. And I love that about you. Where did that confidence come from? I think it just came from the sensibility of knowing this is what I wanted to do. What Once I was aligned with my purpose, and I didn't realize that's what it was at the time, but once I was aligned with that, there was no stopping me. And I knew there was no stopping me, but, and that was it. And I've, I've never had any doubts in the direction I was taking. Has never set in frustration at times, of course, but nothing has ever pushed me off course. It, even bad relationships or whatever, never, has never pushed me off course from being aligned with my sense of self and sense of purpose. And that is to, to create, entertain, educate, and uplift. And I think the best is yet to come. I appreciate that.
Well, Lucius, honestly, I feel like I could sit here and talk with you all day. You're such a role model. You speak your truth from your heart, your intelligence, your social conscience, your passion for social justice and equality just shines through everything you do. I am so proud to know you. I thank you with all my heart for coming on our show. I appreciate you so much, Harvey, for all the kindness and everything you just said there. Thanks for having me. I am absolutely 100% positive that you, my friend, are destined for greatness. And I can only hope that you'll find time to come back on our show with every new project, because you know that my door and my heart will always be open to you. Thank you. Our guest has been the amazingly gifted actor, Lucius Baston. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.